Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another conversation under the Playwright Conversation series. And I'm honored to have with me today Professor David Gerard, OBE from New Zealand, all the way from Auckland, a very accomplished sports personality on and off the field or on and off the pool, if I can say so. And uh, David is uh, a really lively person, very active, energetic. And uh, he's, he keeps himself very busy with intellectual as well as physical pursuits, which we'll talk about along the way. A warm welcome to you, David. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vivek. It's, uh, it's an absolute honor for me to be here. And uh, today is uh, our national day. So it's a, it's a double privilege and a pleasure for me to be sharing some words from New Zealand on, on Waitangi Day to... Uh, all the way to India. So thank you very much for inviting me. Congratulations on the National Day and absolutely a pleasure for me as well, David. And let me just introduce you for our audience. Some of them are watching this live and many will be watching it recorded later. So let's uh, get into the details of your career a little bit. You are, of course, an emeritus professor at the Otago Medical School in the Department of Medicine. And your speciality is uh, sport and exercise medicine. You retired from clinical and academic practice in April 2016, and you continue to chair the World Anti-Doping Agency Committee for Therapeutic Use Exemption and are vice chair of the Sports Medicine Committee for International Swimming. Of course, you're also chair of the TUE Committees of Drug-Free Sport New Zealand, World Rugby and FINA. Of course, uh, it's a pleasure for me to also tell our audience that you are a former national and uh, national swimming and surf champion. You were an Olympian in 1964 and are a Commonwealth Games gold medalist and bronze medalist in the 1966 uh, Games. And you're one of the only 11 swimmers to be inducted into the New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame. You also served as a team doctor to the New Zealand Olympic team, twice as chef the mission and medical commission member. And you, you keep busy with a lot of uh, sport, even rugby, I see that you've been involved with as an official. So a lot of uh, very good sports involvement activities, which are very inspiring for someone like me, who's also played a bit and loves sport. Of course, my sport is cricket. And as you know, India and New Zealand share that and I think we can, uh, David, start with a bit of banter because I, it seems that New Zealand and India have a chance to meet in the finals of the World Test Championship. What do you think about that? Yes, I, I think that's a, a very exciting prospect. And I'd like to congratulate you on the performances of the Indian team uh, recently in Australia and what an outstanding victory that was in the final test after... Shall we? We'll forget the first test. I think the ignominy <laughs> of, of of going out for an unmentionable score, uh, yeah. but for for the boys to come so good in in the second and third tests and really to rub the Australians' noses in it. And and if my dear friend Glenn Turner was here with us, he'd be even more excited because every time we see uh, the Australians get beaten, New Zealand takes a little extra pride in. In, in that we 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 remain very force uh, fearful um, opponents on the sports field, the Australians and the New Zealanders, whatever sport we play, rugby or cricket. So it was uh, it was a pleasure, and you're quite right. We could be ending up uh, playing in that that final at Lords, New Zealand versus India. Now that would be a an exciting uh, encounter. Absolutely, David. You do follow cricket very closely, I see, and it is Mr. Glenn Turner who did introduce us. Uh, we can. Thank him and hopefully he'll be watching this sometime. So uh, we're wishing him well and uh, he was absolutely fabulous during his own interview with me for Playwright and uh, great to be connected to him and you. But I, I want to come straight to, since we're talking about him and talking about the game, we we'll start with Kane Williamson because we're on cricket already and how much of an icon he is and how New Zealand uh, youngsters must be looking up to him. Such a balanced young man, a gentleman yes. to the core, plays so well and uh, almost meditative at the crease. Can you talk about him a little and also perhaps how essential it is for young sports people to imbibe qualities like his to be successful? Yes. yes. 
Well, you're, you're quite right, uh, Vivek. I, I think the qualities that Cain uh, demonstrates uh, are those of, of um, humility and humbleness. Um, and as a captain, by leading, leading by example, leading from the front, um, he's very well regarded by his teammates. And I think that shows on the field. Uh, they respect him, and it's a mutual respect. And I think leadership is something that comes from those qualities. And he he has endeared himself also to the New Zealand public. Um, Kane is is a national treasure. He's a national icon, and in a country where cricket and rugby are our our two great sporting passions, I have to say, uh, he's the the Richie McCaw of of uh, of cricket. And uh, both men have. Um, have performed very creditably both on and off the field. And I think if there is a message, and you're quite wise in, in raising it, if, if there's a message to young athletes, it's um, it's to have that humbleness and 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 earn the respect of your, your teammates and the public by demonstrating your ability both on and off the field. And, and both um, Kane and Richie McCaw um, are very level-headed young men who are grounded and they never, ever forget their roots uh, because we all come from a, a club. We all come from the support that is derived from our families and our, our siblings who often have to give up a lot because we want to play sport and the family the family endorses what we do. So I think we should always remember the, the philosophy that uh, we all come from a very humble, similar beginning. And it pays us, uh, I, I think, well just to have continued respect and not to, not to get over over excited and over exuberant. I, I guess I have to say that the the way that uh, certain North American athletes perform on the field of play is nothing that uh, inspires me. And unfortunately, many of the Australians in many different codes copy that. And I like to see a little bit of humility and uh, and humbleness and we like to think that's the kiwi way of doing things and uh, you 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 point to kane williamson and i think he epitomizes those characteristics i think i can sense a lot of love hate for australia already in two bits of uh, questions that we discussed and it's quite natural for a kiwi to feel that way <laughs> but i can i can agree with you david i i totally agree i think the new zealand way is a very good way of approaching life itself as a motivational speaker. I've been talking to youngsters and I think that uh, he, Kane, is definitely one of the role models. But coming to your own Olympic career and the Olympic Games, you were a youngster in 1964 and you were participating in the Olympics. How big was the stage? How much do you remember? What was the feeling like and has it lived with you all these years? Yes, I have to say, uh, Vivek, prior to the Olympic Games, I'd had one, only one international exposure in, in my chosen sport, and that was a Commonwealth Games uh, in Australia in 1962. And if my memory serves me correctly, there was a very strong Indian contingent at the Commonwealth Games then, as there has continued to be at subsequent Commonwealth Games. So that was really my first opportunity to... Uh, to spread my wings in the international forum. Uh, between 1962 and 64, as I say, I didn't have the chance to travel out of New Zealand, so my experience was limited. And getting to the Olympic Games was a was still, you know, one of the greatest highlights, personal highlights of my sporting career. And I have visited Japan probably 20 or 30 times since in various roles over the last. 45 or 50 years and uh, I still enjoy going back and I still have fond memories of the the opening ceremony in Tokyo in 1964 and I like many others was saddened by the fact that the Olympic Games that were scheduled for last year had to be postponed because I know the Japanese were very very passionate about hosting the Olympics for the second time but it was a great honor and a great privilege for me to be there and I guess it paved the way for me to have a little bit more confidence in the international arena to come back to the Commonwealth Games two years later. And, and having been um, ranked in the top 10 of the Olympic Games to come back and, and be a, um, or just outside the top 10, uh, to come back to win a Commonwealth gold medal and, and swim a time that, that would have given me a final placing uh, at, at Tokyo and the subsequent um, 
uh, subsequent games in, in Mexico City in 1968, by which time I had retired. So medicine had taken over my life. <laughs> so lots of lots of memories and 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 lots of wonderful wonderful friends that I've made along the way and huge privilege as we all know to be exposed to the international sporting arena. David, that's amazing to hear and uh, very inspiring. And let me talk about the Olympic Games on the whole. I mean, we know that the Olympics have been postponed by a year. I know that you are involved with the 2021 Games, as you said, and they're in Tokyo again. And also, you've been chef the mission, you've been team doctor for the New Zealand contingents. What is it about the Olympic Games that really makes it the greatest show on earth? And how can a country like India, which is not as successful, and even New Zealand, it's a small country, but would love to be more successful in the Olympic Games. Uh, how can we inspire our youth to excel to that level? Yes. Well, the first thing is that uh, the Olympic Games to me is the epitome. It's the, it's the, the peak of, of sporting excellence. And even in sports where there might be world championships, and of course many international federations host their own world championships, but if you spoke to somebody uh, and, and, and said, would you rather be the world champion or the Olympic champion, I think most of them would, would agree that the, the tradition and, and the kudos that goes with an Olympic gold medal and the ceremony that, that surrounds the Olympics and the tradition of the Olympic Games is the preference to most, to most people. So I think in that respect, it, it, is, it is the epitome of, of international sporting success. But of course, not every sport is included in the Olympic Games. Cricket, for example, is not. Um, rugby has found its way back into the Olympic Games. But I guess I'm, I'm like a lot of people that wonder at the expansiveness of the Olympic Games today. And I guess I'm a traditionalist who would like to think that maybe the Olympic Games is not the place for rugby or for golf or for tennis even or now surfing and rock climbing and, and goodness knows the list grows and grows and we've got we've got soccer teams playing at the Olympic Games but not really representative of the top soccer players of the world because FIFA limits the the age and the experience of players that they release for the Olympics. Uh, we know that in basketball, for example, there's a huge um, absence of many of the top professional basketball players from the United States, for example. And, and uh, you, you know, so many sports, uh, that they treat the Olympics a little bit lightly. And if that's their attitude, then perhaps we should think about uh, uh, maybe not inviting them back. Uh, not that I have any decision making in that capacity. And uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the people that call the shots are those who understand the television draw and, and the financial return from many of these sports. So, the Olympics is very special and has been special for me. And, and when I hopefully get to Tokyo later this year, that will be my 12th Summer Olympics spanning the past 50 years. And it's a, you know, a, a career that's, that's given me, as I've said earlier, many highlights and the privilege of meeting some wonderful, wonderful people uh, representing New Zealand in various capacities, both administrative and medical and and as you mentioned, in 1996 in Atlanta, I was the New Zealand chef de mission. Uh, some people are not aware of that role. It's got nothing to do with um, uh, with cooking and, and, and <laughs> providing the athletes with their food and menu. The chef is the, it's a French term, of course, as many of your, your viewers will be aware. The chef de mission is the leader of the, of the mission or the team. And as such, you are the, the general manager of the team. And it carries a lot of responsibility. And I think having been an Olympian myself and having experienced it, it helped me immensely to, to undertake that role and provide some guidance and leadership for the athletes. And I saw my role as providing the environment in which our athletes could compete to the best of their ability. And we have another Olympian leading New Zealand as the chef de mission, his name is Rob Waddell, and Rob was a, a rowing gold medalist from the uh, the Olympic Games in Sydney in 2000, and he's taken on the professional role now uh, as chef de mission of the New Zealand Olympic team, and is doing an absolutely outstanding job. And I think partly because he's had that experience and he knows exactly how the athletes feel, and he's not there for the the, the socialisation. He's there to to maximise the opportunity for our team and our athletes. 
So there's some of the things that I feel encompass the spirit of Olympism. But Olympics is more than just the sport. It's bringing nations together. It's it's defining people by their sporting capability, not by their uh, their ethnic, uh, cultural uh, demarcations or their religious beliefs or or anything of that nature. It brings athletes together on a very level playing field, and and that to me is the beauty of of the Olympic Games, where uh, where, where people from all corners of the world of the world can can come together and, and and meet together in a in an amicable yet highly intensely competitive environment and forget all about the political, religious and cultural aspects that in other times uh, you know separate us in the world. So I think the Olympics does a yes. wonderful job in that respect. Yes, yes, David. I think that's a very good answer, very comprehensive and uh, totally true. My co-founder of Playwright is asking a question in the middle, and I, I think it's important to take it now. So he's talking about the fact that, of course, uh, you mentioned some rare games, and he says skateboarding and breakdance is also part of the Olympics, which I'm uh, cringing at, and you're cringing as well, I guess. But, um, but, but the question he's asking is, should they do away with the tag of amateur for the Olympics? And I want to add a sub question to that. I mean, till you're an amateur, you're playing clean, you're you're performing for the love of it. Of course, you want to win, I guess. But the moment you turn professional, why does why do some people their attitude become so short and you know even uh, even let's say uh, hitting below the belt kind of attitudes? So sure. why and how can we? ensure that professionals also play for the purity of the sport? Well, when I competed at the Olympic Games, you could not be a professional. The Olympic Games were considered to be a, an international event for amateur athletes, uh, athletes who had day jobs. Uh, everybody in the New Zealand team uh, was uh, dutifully employed or was studying or, or whatever. Uh, was in, a, in an occupation serving an apprenticeship so we all had jobs and sport was uh, was something that we did as a pastime as a as a, a real interest and then we we saw that and it happened of course it happened in cricket it probably happened in cricket a lot earlier but it happened in rugby uh, you know in uh, the late 90s early 2000s where professionalism became part of that game and so too with the Olympic Games, we saw the advent of professionalism. And now, of course, if virtually every athlete from, from the major nations is, is a full-time professional athlete. Uh, very few of them at, at the top level will have any other occupational requirement of, made of them. So their time is devoted and dedicated to training and preparation. Now, when that happened, you, you're quite right. The, the the dollar sign was the was the driving force for many of them, and what we saw then was the advent of of cheating. And the biggest form and the greatest scourge and cheating in sport has clearly been the use of performance enhancing drugs. Now, as a physician and as an athlete who who swam through the ear of the East German athletes, whom we know now were all drugged on, on anabolic androgenic steroids and other very potent performance enhancing drugs. I have this, this real sense of, of, um, of fairness and, and believe that uh, we should be working hard as we are to, to, to fight drug misuse in sport. And, and I must, at this stage, be very, very congratulatory of the, of the National Anti-Doping Agency of India that is, is a relatively recent organization in the last... 15 years has, has demonstrated its need to, to um, come of age in this area, to explore and undertake anti-doping education for young athletes in India of all sporting uh, disciplines. And uh, I, I must say that they're, they're doing a fabulous job and they're represented at, um, at many, many um, of the events that I attend and uh, their, their physicians and and experts um, are, are present in, in in a number of different settings. So I think um, I, I think that the the for me it was the advent of professionalism that created the the um, um, the impetus for for drug misuse. And I think it's it's meant that um, 
you know, we've seen a huge amount of time and effort and energy expended in that area of, of anti-doping and chasing the cheats. And I'm sure we can explain that in greater detail a little bit further on. Yes, David, I think you're absolutely right to bring in uh, doping. And uh, But let's talk about the larger context of um, cheating or playing fair uh, first. So, you know, what is it, that tipping point? I mean, a sportsman who's loved the game, excels at his sport, maybe a football player, and suddenly he starts diving. I mean, you know what diving is. It's a minor, yes. minor yes. transgression compared to doping, I guess. But it's yes. still, I mean, enough to, it's called cheating because he hasn't been hit on the shin or anywhere and he just jumps, he dies. And we know yes. that very leading uh, footballers, perhaps even Neymar has been named for, for doing that. And uh, yes. I think it's something where suddenly it's also it's also true of society. If we look at the larger picture of society, policeman in a third world country who's, who's got a job and he's mm, doing clean stuff, so, suddenly he's offered a bribe and he accepts. That human element of you know that that lying cheating comes in somewhere, and that is a place where we need to perhaps watch our youngsters. Maybe training them not only in sport but also training them about life as they go along, as they're learning to participate at high level sport. They also perhaps need to be trained as uh, good human beings with values, and that is something which I don't think any sport focuses on. So please talk about that and also bring in uh, the drug element a little more based on your studies after that. Mm. Well, the first point you raise is something which is very near and dear to me because I've had a great passion for for the development of sport for children. And, and um, I, I think in New Zealand, we, we make the mistake of, of introducing competitive sport far too early for kids. I, I believe that up probably to the age, the early teenage years, 12, 13, uh, children should be exposed to a variety of physical activity. They should be taught the fundamentals of um, of kicking a ball, a round ball, an oval ball. They should be uh, given a cricket bat or a hockey stick and learn hand-eye coordination and taught to to uh, hit small round balls and and play basketball. They should be learned to. They should be taught rather in learning to tumble and to run and be rhythmic and gymnastic. And by the time they get to an age of twelve or thirteen, they're they've then got if you will, a, a menu of, of skills and, and capabilities from which they can choose which they want to continue with because whatever they want to do is going to require a huge amount of commitment and personal time and energy and training and practice. And what we should be doing with youngsters, whether it be a, a team of young cricketers or – and I've got five little grandsons and, and each one of them uh, plays cricket – they play rugby, they play soccer, they play basketball, they play water polo, they love the surf, they can all swim. And I'm so proud of my sons who have, have given my grandsons this opportunity to, to have this, this whole menu of, of activities. And if we've done it properly, we've taught them the correct skill set. So the ability to bowl a cricket ball or to, to hold a bat correctly or to learn a swimming stroke correctly or to hold a tennis racket or you can think of many, many different sports in which it's important to learn the technique. And that's the fundamental skill that we should, we should introduce early on. And at the same time, we should teach kids that the important thing is not to win, but it's to have fun at what you're doing. And it's only when you introduce the concept of winning and winning at all costs and having national championships for under 10 and under 8 and, and all these ridiculous age group competitions that, that uh, extend through to swimming and, and, and junior age rugby and cricket. And, and we're as bad in New Zealand as anywhere in the world for doing this. We should make these non-competitive opportunities for the kids to participate, have a bit of fun. And, and that if you, if you do make a mistake, you're taught about it on the, on the field of play and it doesn't cost you a run or a wicket or a, or a goal or a, a race, but you're told that that's not the way to do it. Now let's practice, let's do it again and bowl that ball this way or face, uh, you, you, you know, play the shot this particular way. So learning is important, not so much the winning. And when the winning happens, 
kids are natural and some of their coaches uh, invest in, in, in this as well and they teach the children elements of, of shall we say cheating it might be you know playing a little bit offside and it's okay until the referee spots you and you get penalized so the the, the penalty is not you know playing offside it's getting caught so the children are taught that the cheating's okay unless the referee or the umpire picks you up on it i guess it's like it's like walking in cricket isn't it there's a there's a uh, uh, we used to say a gentleman's agreement, but now with with women doing so well in cricket, we say a gentle person's agreement that uh, if you if you have nicked the ball, that you you do walk, uh, even though the umpire, although with electronic means now and the third umpire watching closely, you, you're very unlikely to get away with it. But you know what I mean. Those sentiments of fair play should be instilled very very early, early in life. Now that's the first form of cheating that children are often introduced to. And it's, it's not a big leap to think of other ways to beat the system. And sadly, when professionalism became so evident in sport and the introduction of drugs and the opportunity to use a performance-enhancing substance became available, then the next step was taken by some young athletes aided and abetted by their coaches and, and other senior members of the entourage. So I, although I've taken a big leap from the the elements of cheating to which you referred and then jumped ahead to to cheating through the use of drugs you, you get the sentiment that i'm trying to express and i, I, yeah. I yeah. totally understand David. i think your point about young children is very well taken i totally agree with it i think it's important to learn to win and lose with economy and, and uh, even mindedness and I think that cutthroat kind of competition that I, my parents tell me that you better win this uh, gold medal. You've gone under 12 and under 14 and you can't handle your own emotions. So, yes. But we'll come to that uh, some other time. I think the most important point that I would like to raise with you and which you already touched upon, someone like Lance Armstrong, uh, someone like Ben Johnson. I mean, Lance Armstrong was like the, he was the gold standard for physical Endeavor, the Tour mm. de France, and uh, you know my co-founder Chitranjan really follows that and loves it. I mean, he to for him to be taking performance and enhancing drugs. You have been involved with anti-doping. You are a commissioner. You are an official. You've been a thinker, a planner. So, what is your take, and what can we do even now to prevent people from doing this, even of thinking of? Mm. Well. The two cases that you refer to um, are very typical of what happens. The, the the Ben Johnson affair was back in the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul when Ben Johnson was caught using um, a very potent anabolic steroid. The truth of the matter was that he was probably the best runner in, in that field, even though Carl Lewis was, was in, in the field too. And he probably didn't need drugs to perform. He was a big, strong athlete and he was well coached and, and well prepared. However, his coach and his team doctor used uh, an anabolic steroid, a potent um, masculinizing hormone that produced in him the explosiveness that, that, that won him his gold medal. And and of course, you know the history to this. He was, he was found to be cheating and sent home from the Olympic Games in Seoul in, in great disgrace and sent back to Canada. That, that brought about a huge inquiry in Canada, an inquiry into the use of drugs in sport, because, because it was there. It was made quite clear that uh, there were a number of athletes, probably, and probably athletes in, in that event. I mean, it's rumored that, that, that Linford Christie, who, who was placed third and got the silver medal and Carl Lewis who was second and got the gold that they had a, a, a rather nebulous uh, background as well and, and, and there had been some uh, fingers pointed at them but they'd never actually been caught with, with anabolic steroids or any other prohibited substances in their urine. So for all intents and purposes they passed the doping tread test on that day and they were cleared and they were um, promoted. Ben Johnson, however, has been the standard and, and is often referred to as the first and, and only significant track and field athlete to win a gold medal at the Olympics and be sent home for cheating. Now, Lance Armstrong was, a, was another, another case, but 
The similarity was that he was aided and abetted by a very, very sophisticated network of sports science and sports medicine. He had a very clever doctor, um, uh, Dr. Michele Ferrari, who was an international specialist in sports medicine and exercise physiology, who was very highly regarded for the work that he did in sports medicine, but who turned to the dark side and he found ways to uh, introduce uh, drugs to uh, Lance Armstrong's training protocol that were not able to be detected. It wasn't so much that the drugs were designer steroids that hadn't been identified earlier, but it was the way in which he used them in small doses and the use of a substance called EPO, erythropoietin, which is a hormone that enables our bodies to manufacture increased numbers of red blood cells and your ability, therefore, to carry more oxygen, which is the currency for, for endurance, sport and energy, was enhanced. Now, Lance Armstrong was successful in beating the anti-doping world for nearly 10 years because his doctors were ahead of the game and they were administering the drugs in such a way that when Lance came to be tested after a stage in the Tour de France, he'd be clear. Um, they knew that he wouldn't probably be tested until the next day. And so during that night, they gave him small doses and a cocktail of drugs that enhanced him for the next day and were mostly cleared from his, his system by the time the testing came at the end of the next uh, stage. But it was very clear. The sadness was that he, he, he strung us all along because I was, uh, I was an absolute devout follower of Lance Armstrong for the reasons that you mentioned. Outstanding athlete with wonderful capabilities and, and a wonderful track record in, in Olympics and in, in uh, professional cycling. And when he, when he developed testicular cancer, which is very widely written about and he publicized in his, in his first book, um, we all felt very sorry for him. And then he recovered miraculously and got back and, and, and won another three or four, was it four, a total of seven Tour de France uh, victories. We, we were in absolute awe of what he did and achieved. And then he turned his energy into uh, the uh, Live Strong uh, anti-cancer you know, research program. He raised thousands, millions of dollars in the United States for cancer research. But all the time he was cheating and he was using his name and his reputation for a good cause. But, um, you know, we couldn't forgive him at the end when, when he was caught and clearly uh, exposed uh, all along the way, he had, had said that he had never used, never knowingly taken a, a performance-enhancing substance, which, of course, was untrue. And I think that the sadness was the lying and, and the loss of, of, of face and, and the fact that we, 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 we can never forgive him for that because the damage he did to many, many young athletes who admired him and many older athletes and people like myself who had great admiration for him were... Uh, totally destroyed by the the truth that came out so that's the sadness of it and you're always disappointed when you see your idols uh, actually getting there by foul means rather than fair absolutely david and uh, before i come back to the celebrities handling their sport it's very important to drift into your own field of academic excellence and you are a professor of medicine of sports and you have uh, taught at uh, the University of Otago, you've researched, and even now you're involved. So tell us more about the field and tell us more about uh, what are your findings and what are your recommendations? Mm. Well, the area that I've spent most of my time researching and working in over the last probably 30 years is in the area of what we call therapeutic use exemption. So. Vivek, if you were a, a severe asthmatic or an insulin-dependent diabetic and you are required to use a, a substance which is on the world anti-doping prohibited list, we can, um, we can allow you, we can permit you for medical reasons, uh, legitimate medical reasons, to use a banned substance. And so this is where I've, I've put most of my time and research and energy in over the last decade or two. Um, in promoting and making making it uh, just as, as opportune for 
a severe asthmatic to become a good swimmer or a good cricketer or an insulin dependent diabetic to be able to play sport to the highest level uh, or a child who suffers from uh, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity syndrome to be able to use um, the medication that, that he necessarily or she necessarily deserves to use uh, but the fact that it's on the prohibited list should not mean that they can't perform with their peers and their colleagues. So that's the that's the area that I've really worked in. But the principles of, of anti-doping are based on the fact that we shouldn't be using drugs that were designed for the treatment of people with severe medical conditions. We shouldn't be using these in the in the um, in the area of sport to perform uh, to to enhance the performance of fit and healthy young athletes. That's not what EPO that I mentioned earlier with respect to Lance Armstrong. This is a, a very potent drug that, as I said, stimulates red blood cell production. And this is a drug that we reserve for people with uh, severe forms of, of cancer, some uh, people who have chronic uh, kidney failure, who can't produce their own EPO, are entitled to use these very, very potent and very helpful drugs. And, and when we learn that athletes are using these to enhance their sporting performance, it, it it makes us all very confused and very upset and very saddened by the fact that, that these these uh, concepts are, are being uh, that the water is being muddied by people who are misusing drugs. So it's the it's the misuse of drugs. It's the fundamental concept that we we want to guard against. Not only that, but there's a very significant health factor in you taking a drug for which you don't have a medical reason. Now, EPO, as I said, makes your red blood cell production more prolific. But if you have too many red blood cells, your blood becomes very thick and, and viscid, like oil. And if it becomes that thick, it cannot uh, be transported clearly and comfortably through your circulation, and you might develop blood clots. And if you develop a clot in the circulation to your, your brain, you have a stroke, or if you have a clot in the in the coronary arteries that supply your heart, you have a heart attack. And many, many young cyclists in the 80s and 90s who were experimenting with EPO had these terrible, terrible medical consequences. And there were a number of reported deaths in, in the medical literature demonstrating the fact that the misuse of these drugs carries a very significant health uh, you know, risk as well. Anabolic steroids can create uh, all sorts of uh, psychological problems in terms of aggression and, and then on withdrawal. You, you find some athletes become intensely depressed. There have been uh, acts of suicide from athletes who have come suddenly off high doses of anabolic steroids. Um, for for male athletes, there there are conditions associated with heart disease and and uh, a number of different forms of cancer, which have very close links to the misuse of high dose anabolic steroids. So I could go on and on, and we use this as part of the education when we say to young athletes, you don't need these drugs. You need good coaching. You need good nutrition. You need good psychological support. You need an entourage of people around you who are supportive. And of course, you've got to want to do what you are doing uh, for the right reasons. And you should not be propped up or prompted by somebody who's offering you a, a shortcut to success because you and I both know whether it's cricket or swimming or rugby, there is no, first of all, you've got to choose your parents wisely, as I'm sure we, we're all aware, we need to have the natural talent and the ability. The second thing we need to do is to work hard. And the hard work means in a sport like cricket, it means lots of practice. And by practice, I mean technical skill acquisition and practicing your stroke play and your bowling technique and fielding and, and all the other characteristics that make up a good a good cricketer. For me as a swimmer, it was learning, you know, how, how to swim the stroke technically well and efficiently, to turn well, to start well. So that's the techniques. And then comes the training. Okay, there's practice on one side and training on the other and the many, many hours of training. And we've seen, and, and I, I'm, I'm bouncing back and, and reflecting on cricket a little bit, but 
you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen a huge change in the traditional approach to fitness and cricket. Now you've got cricketers who are genuine athletes. Once upon a time, we used to look at the West Indian team and think they were naturally endowed, you know, spectacular athletes on the field. And you you think of, of, of members of the former MCC, the gentleman from England who played cricket, you know, the portly uh, Colin Cowdery. He, he'll forgive me. I'm not sure whether Colin is still still around, but the people of his his, his vintage who were a very sedate and, and we couldn't actually say that they were athletic. They were very, very skillful. And, and we, we know that uh, there were some incredibly talented uh, and skillful cricketers of that era. But as athletes, they, they were not considered to be the class that they are today. And I know when I, when I see the Indian team and I see the New Zealand team playing and the way they run in the field, uh, you, you know, some of these spectacular catches and, and uh, th- there's, there's no place to hide and, and you can't be an overweight slug on the cricket field any longer. And I think that's the other element, is training and practice. And these are the, the skill sets that are, that are required for sport today. I think, I, you I, think put it, I think you put it very well, David. Uh, uh, I was going to ask you uh, to guide youngsters uh, about it, but I think you already said it. And, you know, hard work, technical skills, the right psychology, the right nutrition, the right uh, athleticism, working on your physical, mental, and if I may say so, even spiritual fitness, meditation, concentration. These are the things which will help them to succeed today. But I want to bring you a little bit to New Zealand, and that's where you are in Auckland. And you, I know you have a very active uh, time of it. Um, you, you are a professor emeritus, and I know a few of that uh, genre who are probably not into surfing or sailing or anything of the sort anymore, but you are. I know you've been sailing for a fortnight recently or more. I know that you are an active swimmer and you go out with the boys. You have five grandsons, as you said, and I'm sure you have some granddaughters coming along also. And so it's fantastic how you keep so fit. So tell us a little bit about your own sporting life and physical activity even now, because many of our viewers are of your age or even older perhaps, and of course, some are younger as well. So yes. um, what's your advice to them? Well, I think my advice is is to keep life in balance and physical activity should be very much a part of everybody's, uh, you know, daily um, daily menu of, of activity. And it doesn't have to be training to run a marathon. I think we we need to exert ourselves on a regular basis in terms of our heart and our lungs to get our pulse rates up. And, and to breathe a little harder for a few minutes every day and make that very much a part of your daily routine, whether it be going for a brisk walk or a cycle or, 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 or in my case, uh, I find swimming is, is my happy place and I'm happy being out in the surf, uh, either swimming or on my board, um, trying to catch a, a large wave and expending a bit of energy, but at the same time having a lot of fun. I think building that into your regular routine is is very, very important, as it is um, accepting the fact that nutrition is also part of the balance. We should be you know, measuring our energy expenditure against the amount of energy we put in, and, and, and weight gain is a consequence of, of taking in much, too much fuel and not burning, burning that uh, fuel up in, in terms of energy expenditure. So that's a, a simple... Um, a, a simple tip from, from from me for those people who are struggling to uh, to keep their weight in, in check. Uh, I, I think also taking time to sit quietly and reflect, to take time away from uh, media and devices and and our commitment to uh, sitting in front of a screen and notwithstanding what we're doing now, because this is all part of, of modern living and the, the transmission of, of opportunity for discussion and, and sharing advice. But I think we need to take some time. There's nothing wrong with sitting down in the, in the shade or the sun and uh, you know, snuggling up with a, with a good book and having a read every now and then, or just turning your mind to a little bit of reflection. So I think it's that that's the mental side of things. And for some people, there's a there's a very deep and spiritual side to life. I'm I'm not a particularly um, religious person by my background, and 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 spiritually, I 
I find peace in, in just being at the beach and I can sit and watch the waves. I can gain a huge amount of, of um, uh, relaxation and peace of mind just simply by being outside and, and enjoying the fresh air. For me, that's, uh, that's the spirituality that I receive from, um, from my reflection. Uh, so I think it's a balance of all those things. I, um, as many of your viewers will have been doing the calculations, I was um, I was 21 in 1964. So uh, they've probably calculated now that very soon I'm about to have my 76th birthday. And I, I, I think I think uh, age is only a only a number. As Joan Collins said, age is only important if you happen to be a bottle of red wine. Where <laughs> age is important, but uh, no, I think it's all a state of mind and a, and a state of balance and an understanding that uh, you know life is to be lived and let's be active and we should uh, we should wear out rather than rust up and seize up. So keep moving, and and I hope um, any of your viewers that uh, are looking for the, the the panacea for all ills, it isn't there, but it's a balance of these things and uh, enjoyment and. And happiness, uh, I think, is also part of that that mix. Very important complex. Well, listening to you, uh, one can uh, agree with one of our viewers who says that you're a true sports person. I think you're a champion of sport and the true values of sport and the true ideals. And there's a Colonel Chima, who's a regular viewer of our conversations, and he was talking about the cheating part. And he says that when the best players cheat, it is the worst lilies that fester the smell far worse than the weeds, and he's quoting Shakespeare. So I don't think you or I studied Shakespeare. Maybe you did, I didn't. But I'm a bit of a writer, and I, I love his writings as well. But I think, uh, David, you summed it up very, very well. I think the balance between your love, various activities, spending time with nature, outdoor sport is my thing as well. I'm not a particularly big fan of the gym. If you can run outdoors or you can do some outdoor exercise, it's uh, fantastic rather than going to the, but anyway, those who don't do anything, the gym is great. And then sure. also, you know, to, you know, David, because we're running out, I have one last question for you. I'm going to put you a little bit in the spot. So I'm going to say that apart from cricket, my two greatest uh, sports icons, according to me, are Roger Federer and Usain Bolt. And I think that these two people are just, I mean, they give so much joy when I see them in action, Roger Federer and Usain Bolt. How about you telling me two or three of yours and include one Kiwi uh, at least? Well, I think uh, the, the, the one Kiwi that, that stood out for me was the late Sir Peter Snell, who was a, a, a wonderful um, uh, advocate for New Zealand, uh, a, a triple Olympic gold medalist who, who was also somebody who balanced his life in, in academia and sport. And, and uh, so Peter passed away um, a couple of years ago now, and he left a great legacy, and he was a great inspiration to many young uh, New Zealand athletes. Um, there, there were several uh, All Blacks that, that I, I became to know and, and, and admired. Um, Sir Brian Lahore was one of them who's unfortunately passed also. These are names that are probably not known to your viewers, but they were people whom I, I felt left for me some real examples and some legacies. And then there's the people who balance their lives in such a way and the athletes who prepare for life after sport because this is something we haven't had a chance to talk about, but it's an important message for us as sports administrators to, to say to some young athlete that one day you're going to have to hang up your boots. Uh, for me, it was hanging up my swimsuit. And, uh, uh, you, you know, but there comes a time when you've got to think of, of life beyond sport. And sport might be as, as long as your next injury or health problem that might uh, cause, a, 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 you know, an early retirement. So I think it's important and it's good for me to reflect on some people that I've met over the years that have inspired me to put in place a plan for life when you finish your sport. And the person that's probably kept me sounded and grounded for the last 52 years has been my wife, Barbara, who's put up with a huge amount. Yeah. And uh, uh, none of what I've had the chance to do, I could have done without her who looked after our three boys when I was gallivanting around the world on some 
uh, Olympic gig and she was at home with the family. And I mean, I think that's all part of it too. And uh, it's a sport is a team effort, whether you're an individual or a member of a, of a, of a larger group. Uh, so I would like to pay that uh, tribute to her. That's very well said. And I'm, I'm really grateful that you, you mentioned her and I totally agree with you. The spouse often does, uh, you know, the hard work while uh, one of the spouses is enjoying himself or herself uh, sure. somewhere else in the world. But I think uh, what came out through this uh, interaction, David, is your uh, three things, I would say, your love for sport, there's no doubt about that. Your care for humanity and young people, what you want them to be, how would you like, uh, how you would like them to be going forward and for them to avoid all kinds of uh, pernicious influences. And I think thirdly, what also came out was how much you uh, feel for humanity, how much you feel for the world, for your country. I think the goodness shone through, David. So I, I must say that I enjoyed it immensely. I'm sure a lot of people have watched it and will watch it and learn from it and be inspired from your words and your life. So thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. Well, it's it's been my pleasure and my privilege, uh, Vivek, and and I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. And I hope I've left some messages for for your viewers. Thank you. We have. Thank you for joining Playwright Conversations. Thank you very much.